I am the experiment, and uh, two months ago or so, I got an email from Michael here, uh, and he said, uh, this is something that might interest you, coming to uh, USENICS. And uh, I didn't, obviously I had never heard of USENICS, and I really didn't know if he wanted me to speak, because he didn't say anything in that first email. And I said, well, do you want me to speak? And he said, sure. And I said, okay. And uh, not having heard of USENICS, I thought it was a, a little type of an organization, or not because I hadn't heard of it, I just, just didn't realize what it was. So I got here Wednesday, and uh, I arrived here about two in the afternoon, and I trickled on down here, and uh, I peeked in in one of the conferences, and uh, I'm seeing uh, head of Google security, head of Microsoft, security systems analysis. Uh, the next day, the keynote speech by somebody from uh, cyber security at the White House. And I said to myself, you know, what am I getting into here? Uh, did I get off in the wrong bus? Was I supposed to be in Washington State and not in Washington, D.C.? And uh, another thing I'm going to tell you or admit to you is I know less uh, about computers and cyber technology than all of you know about casino cheating, which means I know absolutely nothing. So what am I doing here? Uh, ask Michael Bailey. <laughs> um, all kidding aside, um, how, many, how many people here have, nev have never played roulette in a, in a live gambling casino? <laughs> Uh, well, I hope you all get some entertainment value out of this presentation. Uh, how many of you have never been in a gambling casino, period? Okay, well, that's, I can deal with that. Um, uh, so I, I just said that I don't know anything about computers or computer uh, technology or, excuse me, or uh, hacking or anything like that. but. What I do know is the human factor. Everything I've heard here, and I, I've kind of, uh, during the presentations, and I've kind of suspected this before, it's all been about computer protecting against attack from computer. It's all about information systems there to protect information, and how somebody hacks into it, and then how the, the person designing the uh, security software then takes the next step and tries to prevent the hacker, and it's a, a cat and mouse game. And obviously, something of that nature to me, I can't do anything to uh, attack a computer, or I can't beat a computer. But what happens when you take the computer with all the defense systems in it, and you take it out of the internet, and you take it out of the cyber world, and you put it in the real world, like in a bank or in a casino? Then you have to deal with people like me, who I am of average intelligence, but I have a knack of knowing how to defeat surveillance and, and computer systems. And, and that's what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to try and give a human aspect as to what's, what goes on in the real world with computers versus uh, the cyber world. And, that, and that's, the, that's the experiment. That's the difference between uh, you know, what I'm here for and what everybody else um, has, has spoken about. So what I want to do, uh, basically for, for 25 years I did nothing uh, but cheat gambling casinos uh, all across the world out of lots of money. And I started doing this when I was actually underage uh, to gamble. I was about 18 and at, at the time the legal age of gambling was 21 and I would just go to Las Vegas and uh, you know, it's a long story. I've written books about this. If anyone should get interested, you can go to my website, richardmarcusbooks.com, and you could read about it or read my book or whatever. But anyway, to, to get right to the point, uh, back in the late 80s, uh, when I was known by virtually every casino Interpol agency, every Las Vegas surveillance uh, administrator, surveillance chief, I was known as the best casino cheat in the world. And I had Interpol after me. I had many, many uh, investigations, uh, FBI, this and that. And nobody could ever catch up with me. Nobody could ever gather any evidence on me. And finally, so it's said uh, by other people that in 1989 or so, 
all of Las Vegas and many other gambling areas, they turned to what, what's called the eye in the sky 24-hour video surveillance where they film every second of every table nonstop in casinos. And to this day, that's how casino surveillance works. In the old days, they would have maybe one rotating camera for, for three or four tables. But so it's said, because of me, they decided to revamp all of their surveillance to, to stop people like me. And then it was actually put to me to figure out a way to beat that. And so we're going to start, we're going to show a little video. Now, excuse me, this first video is a little grainy, but you, you'll catch it. I, I had, wait, one, one second before you put it on. I invented this move. Uh, a move is a, a casino cheating move that actually I used surveillance cameras filming me cheat, but being my ally, helping me cheat instead of helping the casino catch me. And uh, when, this, when this thing went public, I wrote a book about it, and it went public, and they made a few TV shows about it. And then uh, I went on, you're going to see in a minute, I went on the NBC Today show and demonstrated the move. So I'm going to show you this move just to give you an idea of how easy it is for, for somebody who has no computer experience, no knowledge of anything, is just a guy more or less in the street who could figure out a way to beat all this multi-million dollar state-of-the-art surveillance equipment. So let's, let's take a look at this video. It's all psychological. Okay, let's go over to the roulette table because you have another scam here that you call Savannah, is that right? Yes, this is the best casino cheating move ever concocted. Uh, you came up with it? Yes, I Excuse did. It's very modesty. simple. Here we have a roulette layout. We have chips on the inside, and all these are $10 bets, two or $15 bets, $5 chips. I come over to the table, and I have a cocktail glass in my hand, and I simply bet the $5,005. This is a $5,000 chip, and I bet it angled so the dealer cannot see the bottom chip underneath. Okay. The dealer spins the ball. If I lose, we're going to say that it comes out on a losing number, say number nine. Right. Okay. I lose, and I quickly grab this up, and I put it in my pocket. And I go, and if the dealer catches me, put that, the dealer says, put that back down, put that down. Sir, what are you doing? And I go into a drunk routine, and I go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that the bet lost, I'm sorry. And I put it back down. But what I put down is $10, not $5,005. The, $5, the dealer never saw the $5,000 chip, so the dealer thinks it's only $10. And I'm a drunk, and I'm acting like this. And now there's no big deal because it's only about $10 and they don't call security. But if that bet had won, it's $5,000. And you leave it, it pays, as is. It, I leave it as is. It pays $10,010 $10 or up to the maximum bet. And they call the eye in the sky because nobody called it out. They have to call out a big bet. All right. But, but and, I, go ahead. But finish up. I mean, they don't call. You know, they, you know, nobody called it. Nobody saw it. So they verify it with the tape and they see that it actually was right. there. So the bottom line is I win $10,000 when, when a bet wins and I lose $10 when it loses. All right. But you'd have to be pretty stupid to do this, right, Richard? Very stupid. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And you don't do this anymore, right, Richard? Okay. You notice I cut it at the right time. And you also notice how, uh, what's her name again? That woman, the, the uh, I forgot her name already, uh, Meredith Vieira. That's it. Uh, you notice how quickly she was pushing me to get me off the set as quickly as possible, so I was in a rush. But basically, let me just explain real fast what I did. I would walk into a casino with uh, two chips. One, the bottom chip was a maximum value chip, whatever the casino had. In that case, it was $5,000. The top chip was $5. Both chips are the same size. I put it down on the layout, and I purposely jutted out the $5 chip off the $5,000 chip so the dealer wouldn't see it. Everybody understand who the dealer is? The dealer is the one who spins the ball, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm not meaning to offend anybody, but you know, since uh, more than half the room has never played roulette, I ha have to explain a little. Okay, so the point was, when the bet won, when the bet lost, I wasn't gonna let them take my $5,005. So before the dealer could actually grab the winning bet, the losing bet off the layout, I would go out and grab it. And if she, most of the time, I wouldn't be seen. But when I was seen, I immediately, because the dealer's reaction would be very negative. The dealer would go, hey, sir, that's a losing bet. Put it back down. Now, she only thinks it's $10, but it's $5,000 with a $5 chip on top. And I would immediately go, oh, oh what did you say? Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, I didn't know the ball dropped. I would go into a drunk routine. 
And why, did, why am I doing this? It's all psychology. It's all to sell that I'm just some idiot who was out there so drunk and slobbering that I picked up my bet after it lost. And since it's only $10 and the eye in the sky surveillance is not concerned about a $10 bet, nobody gets upset. The, 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 the pit boss or the supervisor comes over and, the deal, and he sees me too and I'm slobbering around like this. Well, I didn't know why. You can't take me anywhere. And they, just for, and, they just for, and they just forget about me, okay? Now, what happens if the bet won? Here, here's, where it, here's where it gets good. Now, there's $5,005 bet on this, it's a maximum bet, and it wins. What happens? The dealer in casinos, when, any, when anyone bets, say, more than $100, the dealer has to call it out to the supervisor. Uh, roulette, roulette table number one, I have a $100 chip, or I have a $500 chip, or whatever it is. They have to call it out, and I know this. Now, if the dealer didn't see the bet, the $5,000 chip, the dealer could not have called it out. So when the bet wins and I start, I go, yes, it won. And I start dancing around and go, woohoo! And I won because it's $5,000 there. The dealer doesn't know what I'm talking about. The dealer thinks I'm, I'm drunk, I'm stupid. But now, finally, I point to it. I say, take a look. The dealer peels off the $5 chip on top of the $5,000 chip and boom, bites, her right, bites him or her right in the nose. Now, what does the dealer do? The dealer has to tell the supervisor. The supervisor comes over and sees this $5,000 bet, and that's a huge, huge bet. Nobody bets that uh, in casinos. Nobody bets $5,000 on red or black or, or on, on even or odd. Nobody does it except super high rollers. So now the casino is suspicious. They're suspicious because all of a sudden, out of the blue, somebody bet $5,000, nobody saw it. So what do they think? They think I'm cheating. What do they do? Anybody have an idea what they do? They think I'm cheating? Check the video. Check the video. So they call up the phone. Yeah, uh, roulette table four. Uh, yeah, the guy standing there in the green shirt and glasses, he, uh, he claims he bet $5,000. Nobody saw him made the bet. I'm sure he's cheating. Let's run back the tape. Uh, let's get the evidence, and then let's get him arrested, and let's get him uh, in jail as soon as possible. Okay? And I know that's what their mindset is. I know that's what they're thinking. And I'm standing here, you know, waiting like this. And uh, then they get the phone call back from the eye in the sky. Now, remember, this is after, because of me, that they went to have 24-hour tape on all the games. So I knew they had it on tape. So security uh, surveillance calls back. And sir, what does surveillance tell the people down at the blackjack table? They saw the bet was what? Legitimate. In other words, while the ball was spinning, I didn't make any move. The dealer, the dealer waves off, no more bets. I didn't do anything. I made my bet early. Surveillance calls up, calls down, and says, legitimate, legitimate bet, you have to pay him. Now when I did this one time, five times, ten times, by the 50th time, they all knew all the head surveillance people, like, like many of you people here are, are head uh, security people for um, information systems and computers, all these same types of people in Las Vegas know it's me because they're filming me as I'm waiting to be paid. That's Richard Marcus. He's the biggest cheater in the world. Video surveillance is telling us he's not cheating. Imagine that. The biggest cheater in the world, $5,000 a pop, and surveillance is telling me, telling them that I'm making a legitimate bet. Now, years later, when I, wrote a, when I wrote a book about this and I divulged all this and how I did it, they were stunned. They thought it was anything from I was clocking the wheel or I had some kind of magnet underneath. It but it was so kiss, keep it simple, stupid. It was so stupid that all, all of you people who've never played roulette or the, or the handful that have never even been in a casino could actually go out and do this today. Right? We can all go to the casino tonight after this, after this convention. <laughs> we, we could all go right now. And, 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 and sir, you could be the first. <laughs> you, could all take, you could all take chance. I swear, that's how easy and stupid it was. And now I'm going to show you another clip on the casino's reaction to it when I finally told them what was happening. And don't forget, they, I, they wanted to arrest me more. They, they were after me like, the, like everyone else was after uh, Ben Laden. I was the Ben Laden of casinos. That's how bad they wanted me. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. Oh, sorry. That sounds exciting. That looks exciting. Sorry. Back to videotape and be able to watch it. With cameras watching their every move, 
Marcus realized that to continue scamming the casinos, he had to come up with a big idea. His solution was pure genius. He turned the constant surveillance to his advantage. A simple reversal of the pass-posting move made Marcus a Las Vegas legend. It's so good that anyone could go out and do it right now. Anyone. It's, it's indefensible. Richard's move was brilliant in the light that he put the big bet out in advance and disguised it or hid it from the dealer's view. I found the perfect angle, how to place the chips, and by, by uh, jutting out a red chips, just by angling it off the, the distance of a fingernail, that hid the $5,000 chip underneath. And once we knew that, we had the basic makings of that move. The key to the new move was disguise plus sleight of hand. The high chip was always on the table, but only revealed if the bet was won. Marcus named his new move the Savannah after his favorite Vegas stripper. <laughs> the first time I got paid with the Savannah, it was an orgasm. It was better than sex. It was the biggest high of all time. What we did is when we hid the $5,000 chip underneath and the dealer spun the ball, the dealer thinks there's $15 or $20 there. Now the ball's spinning and boom, it lands on our winning bet. It's either an even money bet or a two to one bet. I start screaming, I won $5,000, I won $5,000 on the first column or on the 19 to 36 bet. Now the dealer has no idea what I'm talking about because the dealer never saw the $5,000 chip underneath there. It's hidden. If the bet wins, you would call upstairs to say, was the bet there? And of course it was. It was there right from the beginning. With the bet confirmed by the camera, the casino had to pay out. But the real skill in pulling off the Savannah came when a bet was lost and the high-value chip had to be removed from the table before the croupier could rake it in. The actual cheating move only happens when that bet loses. And when that bet loses, I just go out and I rake it right off. And when the dealer called me raking off the chips and said, hey, sir, put that down. But what I put down was not the $5,010 I had out there, but the $15 that was in my other hand, the three red chips. But since the dealer never saw the $5,000 chip and thought that the bet was $15, he is satisfied that I put back what was originally there. Over the next four months, Marcus and his team scammed an estimated $2 million using the Savannah. Savannah is my favorite cheating move in the world because it's just, uh, just so much money. Okay, that is an example of taking multi-million dollars worth of surveillance high-tech, uh, state-of-the-art equipment and making it worthless. A simple third-grade elementary thought completely cost, that cost the casinos more money than it did to put this, the surveillance equipment in. Okay, really, that, that's how ridiculous it was. And that, that's a prime, and, and they chased me around Las Vegas and the rest of the world for years trying to figure out what we were doing. Okay. All of you know about RFID technology. I know that. Um, in casinos, it has, it has two uses. One it is for keeping track of players. Every time they put a chip on a table, the RFID chip within the chip tells the casino how much this person is betting and is this person, is he worth comping? Is he worth a free dinner? What is he worth to the casino? And that's 50% that's of why RFID, RFID technology is in casinos. The other 50% is to protect against cheating. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip, uh, and I really th this, this clip is really well done, and it's a great, uh, it really specifies exactly what RFID does for casinos. And then after we see the clip, we're, we're going to take a look at how that, that also gets beat. Quality, cleverness, speed, and savings. These are the features that make this system stand out. The CIS typology, system for the inventory of chips, RFID PJM, represents a real revolution. It is a smart system endowed with several elements able to interact with each other. Abiati Casino Equipment holds the license for this device, designed to link up several practical casino systems and applications. 
patented in 84 countries, in a short period of time it has stirred the interest of operators and players who have recognized its usefulness. The starting point is the RFID betting chip. The betting chip is reborn and takes on a new form. The beating heart is an advanced microchip embedded inside the chip. Its exterior is not different from other traditional betting chips, but inside it contains all the features that make it possible to identify it at all times from a general monitoring system. A real DNA that makes it possible for casinos to conduct real-time monitoring. Instant confirmation, knowledge of the position and trajectory throughout the chip's existence. From the time the betting rooms are opened, we can virtually follow the daily path of the RFID microchip chips. The embedded microchip makes it possible to continuously keep an eye on the chips, from the vault to the cashier. At the start of the day, an inventory is taken off the chips. Then, they are taken out of the vault, checked and handed over to the person in charge of the betting area's cash desk, who carries out a first check and automatic count of the chips. Thereafter, the chips are divided up and given to the inspectors in the appropriate quantities, so that these can reach the specific RFID playing tables equipped with tracking antennae. The first table with an RFID device introduced to the public was the blackjack table. It was a resounding success from the time it first appeared in gambling centers. The enthusiasm generated by this innovative and brilliant system encouraged Abiati's research department to conduct new studies and find applications for poker tables as well. No more errors and maximum playing speed with the smart RFID chip. The way it works is simple, but it guarantees maximum security. The microchip transmits data to special antennae at a very high frequency, interface with monitoring software located on the table that portrays the movements of the chips, guaranteeing accurate monitoring of the game. It is part of an overall network controlled by the main office. Every individual device interacts in real time with the network, providing complete integrated monitoring. To better understand the advantages of the system, let us observe it in action at a blackjack table equipped with RFID. Tracking antennae capable of recognizing and reading microchips embedded in the chips are placed underneath the layout on a traditional table. The table has three sensitive areas equipped with antennae linked to software. The three areas have specific tasks. Going from the center of the table and extending to its edge, there is a first sensitive area in front of the croupier, the float tray. In the half-moon space between the croupier and the play area is the working area, which is fundamental. Its task is to track the chips arriving on the table, either from the cash register supply or those purchased directly from the table by a better. Finally, in front of each better, there are six interactive circular areas, box, which are also connected, thanks to the special antennae, to software and a monitor separate from the table that makes it possible to easily and immediately read the individual bets. We will now analyze these special antennae to appreciate the sophistication of the technology. The antennae cannot be seen from the outside, since they are located underneath the table's layout. They are equipped with an extremely sophisticated tracking system. Thanks to the antennae, dealers and players can monitor every wager at any time in a totally safe manner. Maximum accuracy is assured. When placed on top of the sensitive area, the chips are identified and monitored by antennae all along the surface of the box, both horizontally and vertically. In this way, the monitoring is also guaranteed in special situations, such as when chips overlap are stacked up to a maximum number of 20. Let us now see how easily what I've been describing actually works. Notice how omnipresent that monitor is on the blackjack table. and posted onto that monitor by, through the RFID. Very simple, right? Very foolproof, right? 
wrong. Okay, that's a very sexy tape. I'm sure some of you want to see the end of it, but uh, since, my, since my talk is already shortened, we've got to cut corners. Okay, now, RFID, sir, foolproof, right? I'm sitting at a blackjack table, and I'm going to bet $50, okay? I put the chips down, and as soon as I put the, the RFID is activated, and it shows on the monitor that I bet $50, right? Anybody disagree with that? No. Okay, now if I were to tell you that I bet my $50 and the dealer deals the hands and I win, after the hand wins, the dealer pays me $50, I go out and I pick up my original $50 bet and I switch in a $1,000 chip with a $25 chip on top of it. So I, I take back my $50 and I put back $1,025 and I touch the dealer's hand and I claim and I say, hey, you paid me wrong. I just bet $1,025 and you paid me $50. And so says the RFID monitor that I only bet $50. Now, is there one person in this room that believes that I'm, not, I'm just not talking about a bunch of crap? Is there one person in the, in the room that really believes that I could do what I just said I did. That with the RFID, you saw the size of that RFID monitor, it's bigger than you. You saw it, right? Is there any way possible with, with the dealer here, excuse me, the dealer here, the RFID monitor here, and the supervisors in the pit, is there any way I could claim after the bet was, after the hand was over and they paid me, hey, you made a mistake, and I bet $1,025, which I obviously didn't, I bet $50, and in spite of the RFID monitor, they pay me the $1,025 without even looking at the RFID monitor. Now, how's that possible? Anybody have, anybody have an idea how that's possible? Well, that's what I did, but what I'm saying is, how did I get away with it? How could I, just because I switched the chips, all I have to do, oh, oh no, no, no. But the, 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 what I'm saying is that I'm making the bet when I switch the chips, the $1,000 chip that I put in, of course it has the RFID, RFID code for $1,000, but I made the bet after. It's after. It's after the bet was made. Because the, the original, on the monitor, it shows my original $50 bet. Now the fact that I'm betting $1,025, that nullifies it because I'm betting it after. How do I get away with it? How do they not look at it in the first place? How do, I, how do I get the casino not to look at the monitor? I don't want them to look at it, because if they look at it, I'm dead. It's the ball <laughs> Somebody back there had an idea. Yes? I wasn't thinking getting them to not look at the monitor. I was thinking you could deactivate a $1,000 RFID chip. But I'm, I'm, com I'm computer stupid. I don't know how to deactivate anything except my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> 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 I'm here, I'm, here, I'm, here to, I'm here to talk about ingenuity, not technology, because I don't know anything about technology. If I knew something about technology, Michael never would have invited me to speak here. Yes, sir? They just believe you because their system has so many faults that they haven't got them wrong. Well, that, that's close. Okay, I'll, I'll explain it because we don't want to run out of any more time here. Uh, it's called psychology. It's called so setting them up. So before I made that move, I go into the casino, I go to that very table, and I bet for real, almost like you said, I bet for real $1,025, for real, with a $1,000 chip, with a $25 chip on top, for real. Win or lose, win or lose. I do it again, because I know for every $1,000 I bet, I'm only at a 1% or 2% disadvantage, so in the long run, I'm going to lose $20. So if I have to lose $20 or $40 to set them up, I do it. So now, I bet the $50, maybe there's another dealer there, or there's another pit boss there, or whatever, and I switched it after I win, and I claim, hey, you paid me wrong. What happens? They remember me. 
they remember me because I was already at that table betting $1,025 like I'm claiming I just bet now. But this time I didn't bet it, I cheated. But to set them up, I bet legitimately $1,025 two or three times, however long it takes. That would be my decision based on how I felt about the security situation in the casino. And somebody, somebody said something about, who said something about the fact that the RFI, you did. Uh, that sometimes it makes mistakes. Now, I don't really know the frequency that RFID makes mistakes. Like, what is the probability that it puts the wrong, that it puts the wrong chip amount on, on the monitor? But that's, instead of insulting me because I'm a high roller that they already saw, they don't even bother to look at the RFID because I set them up. I took them away from all the surveillance equipment that they pay to have. And that's more or less... Simple. Now, is, any, is there a casino near here? Is anybody? Uh, uh, anyone? Anyone who want to go tonight with Michael and I to uh, to a casino and see see if any of this stuff really works? Okay. Sir. What is it common for people to bet with sentinel patterns and chips? I mean, essentially, what you're having is uh, you know the average person is going to go in and they'll they'll pull out a stack of fives or fifties or whatever. But they're not going to like put a five thousand dollar chip with a five dollar chip, or does that happen? Very good question. No, uh, no, you've, you you are actually telling me you you have you have no casino knowledge, and you asked that question. Uh, my wife has lost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> my wife loses my money too, but in a different in a different way. Uh, uh, she just steals it from me. Um, the question. Uh, everybody hear the question. The question, the question was, uh, because he, the gentleman noticed that my type of betting, I'm putting a large denomination chip underneath uh, with a regular five dollar, different denomination of chips, and he asked, do, do most people bet that, do, do most people bet normally with the same amount of same color chips, like four green chips or five red chips? And the answer is, you're correct. Most people bet uniformly and they stay within their same color. But most people, it's 70, 80 percent. The casino doesn't blink an eye if somebody bets uh, three different color chips. And, and actually, the colors of the chips and everything have nothing to do with it. Uh, when I hid the chips, or on some moves when I didn't hide the chips, you would think, well, how can he claim he bet a $1,000 chip with a $25 chip on top if they're two completely different colors? Colors have nothing to do. It's the psychology and the, and the when I claim, hey, you paid me wrong, it's a shock factor. I don't want to get too much into that because that's, but, but basically what, what my point is here is with a little ingenuity and psychology, I was able to completely disable RFID, completely disable the eye in the sky, uh, the, the surveillance cameras. Okay, um, the next thing I want to talk about is, ha um, has anybody here heard about people using uh, computers wearing computers on them with earpieces or sometimes uh, scanners in, in cell phones, laser, laser scanners in cell phones to predict where a roulette ball is going to drop and, and try to clock that and, and, and turn the uh, advantage to their side. Lots of you heard about that? Okay, well, we're, we're going to take a, a, a little video on that and then we're, we're going to see what that's all about. This video is far less sexy than the other one. <laughs> The person is wearing the computer, and the ball is spinning, and the computer is supposed to tell... 27, 6. Okay, those two numbers are next to each other on the wheel. Not, not congruently, but they're on the wheel, they're next to each other. And the ball lands on... Well, she's going to show us. 27, okay, that, okay, that time, it, supposedly, it landed right on the number. Bounce, profile, and play. So in the earpiece, in the earpiece, the person with the computer is hearing what the computer is telling them to bet. 16, 24. Okay, that's number eight, which is three or four numbers away. And I'll explain the significance of that, uh, away from the target numbers. Bounce. Play. 
1822. Okay, number nine, so it's right next to 18 and 22. Computers are not this good. This is uh, just to give you an idea of what's happening. Here. Okay. All right. Is that it? Bounce. And play. Uh, one more. By the way, I have a few of these in my car if anyone wants to buy any. Any, any anyone interested? 31, 14. <laughs> okay, so again, it's one off the uh, two target numbers. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, this phenomenon has been going on in, in the casino world for about seven or eight years now, and it was made really really popular in, in 2004 where uh, a group of people from Eastern Europe went into uh, the Ritz Casino in London. Now even if you've never been to London or never been in a casino, you know the word Ritz. It has to be one of those typical fancy London casinos with a lot of high rollers, Arab sheiks, uh, businessmen from Japan, and, and three Eastern Europeans walked in, two men and a woman, and they had laser cell phones, and they walked out of the casino with uh, $3 million. And then the casino tried to block, uh, block the payment, and then they tried to get them arrested. But at the end, uh, they got their money, and uh, the casino couldn't do anything about it. And uh, it cr created a, a craze of using roulette uh, computers in casinos. Now, real quickly, I'm just going to put something on to, to show you basically how, put the uh, document on, please. Basically what, what goes on. What does a roulette uh, computer do? Just uh, read, read through that fastly if you like. It, it's basically what it's about is the, the idea is to clock, the, the ball moves around one way and the wheel moves around the other way and it's to clock the speeds of both and then gauge you have, a, you have a, a point, like if this is the wheel up here, you clock the revolutions, and if you're using the top of the wheel as a reference point, and every time the ball goes around, you, clock, you have a clicker, and you're clicking it, and that's entering data into your computer, and then when the ball falls, of course there's error depending on how a ball bounces, but it's all built into it that if, when you bet straight up on a roulette number, it pays 35 to 1. If you, can, if you can get, let's say, within a, uh, if you can predict where the ball is going to land within, say, six numbers that are not numerically uh, in sequence, but are in sequence in, the, in their positions in the wheel, if you could get within six numbers, one in three or even one in four times, you will have a, a significant advantage uh, over the casino. And, and that's, that's, what, that's how that works. And, uh, uh, casinos, for some reason, you, you will know more about this than I do, are having trouble detecting them because of all the interference with all the cell phones and all the other stuff, all, all their own uh, video surveillance equipment. They're having trouble uh, detecting people with these computers. And, and in the United States, if anyone's caught in, in a casino with a computer just on them, not even actively using it, if you walk it through a casino, uh, floor in the United States with a, with a computer on your body that's in, in, uh, in mode ready to function, it's a felony. Just having it, it's a felony in, in, uh, in Las Vegas casinos. So they're really serious about it. Uh, how? Well, yeah, cell phones, the lasers. Who, who, who said that? Yeah, the, the laser scanners in the cell phones. It's the same principle. And now they're even uh, with Google Glass. No, 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 no. It's just, it's just uh, a cell phone is not considered uh, uh, equipment for. <laughs> I didn't hear that joke. Who, who said what? Somebody said something funny. Oh, okay. Well, as far as I'm concerned, a cell phone's a cell phone. No. 
no, it's only, they're, they're, it's called gaming, cheating at gaming paraphernalia, they call it. Uh, and, and a computer strapped to your body is considered that. Uh, cell phones and Google Glass and all that. You cannot wear Google Glass uh, in a casino. And you can't, you can't have the cell phone, uh, if you're playing in the casino, you can't be on the cell phone at the table in most casinos. Yes, sir. It seems to depend entirely on timing. It's all about timing. It's, it's, it's the speed. It's clocking the speed of the ball and the speed of the wheel. And then when, you, when the ball reaches a certain point, it starts to, uh, the, uh, the speed starts to decay and slows down, and then it falls. And then the other part of the computer also takes into account how the ball is going to bounce, but that's less accurate. Uh, you can't clock the way the ball is going to bounce uh, as, as accurately as you can the speed. But all told, all those elements combined, in most cases, in, in, the, in most of the expensive computers, these computers could cost thirty to $50,000 a piece. It's, people sell them online for like nothing, but they don't really work. I could do this on my cell phone. Yes, you can. I'm sure a lot of people in here have the know-how to, to do this. So uh, like I said, anyone want to go to the casino after the show? <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to make a little money out of this too, so... Uh, uh, what? You'll place the bets? Sir, if you're going to get involved, I'll do whatever you want. Okay. Um, no, the, you, you, you make the bet at the last possible minute because at a certain point, when the ball starts to slow down, the, your computer is giving you the information. Yes, yes, yeah. but at, at, at some point the dealer is going to say no more bets, but it's usually right before the ball falls. Obviously, the longer the dealer allows the betting to go on and, and the closest you can bet to the point where the ball is going to fall, the more advantage you're going to have. So if a dealer waves off the bets very early when there's like two or three more full revolutions to go, then you're, no matter how good your computer is, it's not going to be that profitable. But if the dealer lets, the, you know, lets it slow down and, doesn't, and, and slow and slow, and just before the ball drops, no more bets, then you can obtain an advantage. OK. Um, let's move on to, has everybody, in 2006, uh, I, got a, I got a call from uh, producers from the CBS show 60 Minutes. And they wanted to know, they were thinking about doing a, uh, a segment on online poker cheating. Uh, now, has, ever, has anybody heard about this huge online poker scam that happened, uh, sir? Are, are you talking about the one where the getter just picks on all the players? No, that's, that's just gathering statistics on all the players. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm talking, I'm talking about, I'm talking about. Say that. That's, that's. Uh, elementary scam now. That's, that was even before what I'm talking about. This, this was a scam where if anyone is familiar with online gaming here, if, well, just you don't even have to be, just poker. Is there anyone in this room who's never played a hand of poker? I won't believe a hand's going to go up, even a woman's hand. I, I saw two hands go up. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I, <laughs> sir, you never played a hand of poker in your life. What, what country are you from? United States. United States. <laughs> of America. <laughs> okay, uh, I thought I'd seen it all. Uh, okay, then, sir, I don't know what to say. Okay, uh, in poker, obviously, uh, you get cards face down and you get card, and cards faced up. Everybody sees, and your cards face down. Sir, ace in the hole. You ever hear that expression, ace in the hole? Because it's in the hole, it means you can't see it. Okay, so in all poker games, Car, there, you usually have, the, the big game now is called Texas Stud. You have two cards face down. And it works the same way on, online. But what happened is one person, uh, or people have started to uh, bypass the security code of the providers of the online site of the poker rooms and can see uh, your opponent's hole cards. And this created a mega scam that was, we're going to see a little video on that, uh, but before, before we get into that, I got a call in 2006 uh, from 60 Minutes, and they wanted to know uh, what I knew about hacking into uh, online poker. And I said, just like I told you at the beginning of this speech, I know nothing about it, but I know someone who does it. Okay, and that's the truth. I knew nothing about it, 
but I, uh, you know, when you did what I do for all these years, you meet people in, in this walk of life, and one of the people that I happened to have met and became a friend of mine was a computer hacker, and his specialty was cheating online poker. And it just so happened that I was right in the peak of my friendship with this person when 60 Minutes called me. So I said to 60 Minutes, uh, they want to know what I could, you know, what I knew. Uh, could I contribute to, uh, uh, you know, a segment by them on, on this subject? And I said, well, how about I do this for you? How about I get a hacker? And uh, of course, you can't do anything live, live on 60 Minutes because the show is taped. But I said, how about we come in there and we hack into an online uh, poker game in session? How would you like that? And their immediate reaction was, wow, we're, uh, we're going to have 100 million view viewers. That was their immediate reaction. Then they thought about it, and they thought about it, and they realized that they would be involved in the commission of a crime. <laughs> uh, and, and at the time, uh, it was uh, Steve Kraft, who you're going to see here, and, and um, uh, I forgot the woman's name already, that, that, but it was, they were very excited about it and then they decided they didn't want to do it um, because it's got too many legal implications. And maybe somebody, maybe somebody too within their uh, organization was skeptical, skeptical about the validity of what I was talking about. So it went away and then in uh, 2007 and 2008, what I'm going to show you now happened, C CBS One. In the wild, wild west, when a poker player was caught cheating, it was a capital offense, with the punishment quickly dispensed right across the card table. But today, if you're caught cheating in the popular and lucrative world of internet poker, you may get away scot-free. At least that seems to be what's happening in the biggest scandal in the history of online gambling. A small group of people managed to cheat players out of more than $20 million, and it would have gone undetected if it hadn't been for the players themselves who used the internet to root out the corruption. As a joint investigation by 60 Minutes and the Washington Post reveals, it raises new questions about the integrity and security of the shadowy and highly profitable business that operates outside U.S. law. Its moneymaker puts his name amongst the greatest players in the game. If you had to pick the moment that the oh, poker no, boom began, it was probably the day an unknown accountant named Chris Moneymaker won $2.5 million at the 2003 World Series of Poker. Suddenly, every amateur with a hat, sunglasses, and a stack of chips saw themselves as the next big moneymaker. Nearly 7,000 people competed in this year's tournament for $180 million in prize money, but the fever has spread far beyond Las Vegas. It is the richest sporting competition in the world, and yet all of this pales in comparison to the half a million people who are playing on the internet right now in the unregulated world of online poker. As we learned in this tutorial, all you have to do to play is log on to the World Wide Web, click your way onto an online gambling site, open an account with your credit card, choose your game, and pull up a seat at a virtual table. So like that, these people could be playing from anywhere in the world. They could be here, here in the United States, they could be you know, in India, they could be in South Africa. We should tell you that this $18 billion industry is illegal in the U.S., but the ban is almost impossible to enforce, since the Internet sites and the computers that randomly deal the cards and keep track of the bets are located offshore, beyond the jurisdiction of U.S. law enforcement. And unlike land-based casinos, there is almost no official regulation, enforcement, or supervision. But it hasn't stopped thousands of mostly young men from making this their livelihood. Todd Wittellis, a former computer scientist turned poker pro, says you no longer have to go to Vegas to find well, a high-stakes game. Computer scientists who Here become you poker pros. Living room. You don't have to get dressed. You don't have to do anything. You can just, uh, it's right there on your computer. Wittellis says online poker is much different, faster, more aggressive and less personal. You're not looking at somebody sitting across the table, you're just playing the cards that tumble out of the computer. Not only are you not looking at your opponents, you're not looking at the cards being dealt, you're not looking at who's dealing them to you. So you don't know if uh, the whole thing is legitimate. Even if all the players sitting with you are just as legitimate as you are, maybe the whole game isn't. And as Wittellis found out, it wasn't. 
at least on a popular internet site called Absolute Poker. His suspicions were first aroused in a high-stakes game of Texas Hold'em against what he thought was an incompetent and lucky amateur using the screen name Grey Cat. This Grey Cat person was new, and at first he seemed like a live one. He seemed terrible. He seemed to play crazy. It seemed like he was giving his money away. Except the only thing was, he wasn't losing. He was playing in a style that was sure to lose, but he was killing the game day after day. While okay, Wattelis was it, losing $15,000... I'm going to have apparent. to cut this part because uh, we don't have much time left, and I want to cover one, one more thing. And, and, uh, so what happened here is a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of people, very intelligent people, a lot of them, in, uh, as you heard, a lot of them computer people, were also... High, there seems to be a relationship between high-stakes online poker players and uh, computer people. Obviously, here, as far as we know, it, that, that correlation does not exist. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> At least for, for, the, for the man over there, it, it's very sure. Uh, anyway, um, so what happened was they were, uh, somebody in the room mentioned something about tracking, I think it was over here somewhere, about tracking hands and all that, and uh, that's what they did. They were tracking these hands, and they were seeing that a guy, a guy was playing terribly, because uh, you, can buy, you can buy the programs uh, or, or write your own software to just keep track of every hand, every card, and you can go back and run, you can run back the last 20,000 hands at a particular game or a particular uh, site. And they were finding out that these guys were just playing terrible, but they kept winning. And by playing terrible, it just I mean going against uh, the normal moves that are usually made in a poker game. And through that, they found out, uh, they traced it to uh, IP addresses and all this, and they found out that an ex-world champion uh, of... Everybody heard of the World Series of Poker, please. Okay, every, uh, most people heard of that. And what happened is an ex-champion from the uh, World, poker, World Series of Poker Championship in Las Vegas actually went to work for one of the poker sites, and he was a computer scientist, and he was the one who uh, wrote the software to bypass the security code of uh, Ultimate Bet and Absolute Poker uh, these are two online poker sites, and they, for two or three years, they cheated everybody who played on those sites out of about 40 or 50 million dollars. Uh, and uh, I wanted to do, uh, spend a little more time on this, but unfortunately we can't. Uh, now, I want to do one more thing, and this is where I need your help. Uh, um, I know Michael heard about this. I don't know if, uh, how many people heard about, uh, of, of you actually heard about this, but supposedly in Australia recently, uh, about six months ago, Somebody uh, hacked into the surveillance video equipment of, a, of the Crown Casino of, uh, of a, in Australia and made $30 million. Anybody hear about this? No? Okay. Uh, well, Michael, you and I have something in common. We're the only one watching Australian TV. Okay. Uh, let, let's go to um, the hacking. Now, there's, I want you to watch. This is a very short video. It's a minute and a half or so, but please pay attention to it because uh, I want you to help me understand something. Could be a plot Come for on. film. A high stakes gambler goes high tech, making off with $32 million from an Australian casino. Annabelle Roberts is in London this morning with the details on that. Annabelle, good morning. Erica, the alleged heist was extraordinarily brazen and simple. Hack into the security cameras, take a peek at the tables, and pass the information to a gambler. Easy. It's a scene that could have been ripped right out of the movies, whether it's Ocean's Eleven want to knock over the <laughs> or Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. Gotcha. Just like those films, Australia's biggest casino has been hit by what appears to be a classic sting. A high-rolling customer won at least $32 million after an accomplice allegedly tapped into the casino's security system. According to the casino, the helper hacked into the security cameras and followed the action on the tables, then used an earpiece to let the gambler know how to place his bets. The problem with casinos is that they believe they're unbeatable, and we see over and over again that they're not. The client has been banned and one member of the casino staff has lost his job. The Crown Casino is a favourite celebrity hangout. Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes once stayed here. And now it's facing a new Hollywood twist, but for all the wrong reasons. Erica, casinos really don't like to talk about this kind of breach okay. in security. It's bad publicity. OK, what's, what's wrong with that? Does anyone notice anything wrong with that? They're saying that somebody hacked into the uh, 
casino surveillance video equipment and use that advantage, use that knowledge to somehow win $30 million. What's wrong with that? Uh, he was wearing earpiece. Okay. There it is. What did they see? What does a, a video camera, f uh, a video camera, all they do is film what happened, not what's going to happen. So I, what I don't understand is, and I'm serious, so this is not a test. I don't understand it. How is it possible that if you watch the video surveillance of what's going on in a casino in the past, how does that, how do you win $30 million? So there, I'm wondering, is there something, there's got to be something more to this that maybe some of you folks uh, can enlighten me about, because I think, I think this is all bull. I think it's just a bull story. Even if you're watching live, uh, you have the only thing you the only way to scam a casino out of that kind of money is you have to know the the future. You have to know what cards are coming, and all a camera does is film what cards are either had been played or are being played. But you can gamble in roulette. You can do the same thing with the video from the casino. You could predict the ball. How? If you look at the ball spinning. No, but, but, but I'm talking. I'm talking about this. This happened in cards. This happened in, in a card game. Uh, not, not in this, not in this instance, no. Are you familiar with the MIT club, the, the blackjack? Yes, that's completely, so that's completely that. card counting, nothing more. Right, so they did card counting. So your video surveillance would allow you to do card counting real time and then tell the guy at the table how much to bet to win. But why, why, why would you need video surveillance for that? You can just count the cards yourself. They're well, no, it, 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 I, it, it's it's. It just seems it just seems to me that it's uh, if if that's really true, and I don't know I know I don't know why a casino would come out and say they lost thirty million dollars, but if a casino lost thirty million dollars to some uh, video uh, card counting, uh, some for some video hacking, uh, there has to be more. Uh, so maybe if, if any, my, my my website is richardmarcusbooks.com, and if any of you have any ideas about that. Please uh, let me know, and uh, I'll, I'll write a I'll write a blog article uh, article about that because I'm really interested myself. Uh, let me do, I'll get I'll get your question in a second. Let me just make one final announcement. Um, I yesterday when I was working with Garrett here, and Garrett told me about this uh, this exciting show that was going to go on next door about you know some guy uh, was going to speak about hacking into cars, uh, cars of uh, what's it called exactly a car what system so you could. So you could actually hack into it and then steal the car. You know, I said to myself, the first thing I said to Garrett is, hey, because Garrett told me I had to go up against that. And I said, hey, I got a better idea. You know, maybe Garrett, you could do my talk and I could go listen to that. And, I, <laughs> and, then, and then I said, maybe I was in the wrong business uh, for all these years because that, that sounds really, uh, really cool. Uh, so I'm going to get right over there and uh, watch that too. And uh, you had a question, sir? Yeah, let's go ahead and take the speaker. Yeah. Okay.